Good afternoon and good evening. Uh, bon matin, bon après-midi et uh, bonsoir. And welcome to the second day of the APEC Canada Growing Business Partnership Capstone Conference. My name is Stuart Beck, and I'm president and CEO of the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada. I have, had, I have the pleasure uh, to be your moderator today for today's panel, Policies for Inclusive Growth Across the APEC Region. Since 2016, the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada has implemented the APEC Canada Growing Business Partnership, which endeavors to build the capacity of SM, MSMEs uh, through research, training, mentorship, and in economy programming. The goal of the partnership is to foster sustainable inclusive growth and poverty reduction by building the capacity of small businesses in developing economies in the APEC region. I want to thank the partnerships uh, found, uh, funder, the Government of Canada, for enabling this project and conference to take place. Today's panel will be a moderated discussion between three distinguished speaker, speakers who are leaders in the respective business communities. The goal of this panel will be to discuss the policies needed to promote inclusive growth in the APEC region, particularly for MSMEs, uh, women and youth, and other groups. Our panelists today will provide perspectives on policy implementation, and development based on their backgrounds as leaders in the private sector. We also invite all of you to participate in this discussion by using the chat function. Please send us your questions through the chat box and we will respond in the Q&A portion of our discussion today. That said, I would like now to introduce our three speakers for today's session. President and CEO of the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade, Bridget Anderson. Executive Director of the LVK Group of Companies and ABAC member for Brunei, Hafimi Abdul Haidi. Vice President of Corporate Affairs at Sociedad Minera Cerro Verde SAA and ABAC member for Peru, uh, Julia Torblanca. And I just would uh, note uh, uh, to save time on, on all the bios, you can find them on, under the tab on the left of your, uh, of your screen, of your uh, panel screen. So I'd like to jump into uh, this session, uh, and um, uh, I'm really looking forward to this. I, I know quite well two of, uh, of our members, and I've just got to meet Julia in, in the uh, in the green room before before today's uh, panel session. And wow, we have a really accomplished group. This is really exciting for me to be part of this uh, to be part of the session. So I'm going to start with the first question, and I think uh, Bridget, if you don't mind, I'll ask you to to, to start because um, uh, Anderson is begins with A. Um, what new issues are you seeing uh, SMEs face uh, as a result of the, uh, the global pandemic? And are there successful policies that help uh, MSMEs survive? Well, first of all, uh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, and like most uh, jurisdictions around the globe, we are in the grips of the third wave. So when I think about, you know, what are some of those issues facing some of those small and medium enterprises, it really is what, what every business and every individual is grappling with right now. So, you know, there is the, the vaccine rollout and trying to get to that herd immunity. And that, uh, you know, I, I think just when you think about the domino effect for businesses, we know here in Canada that in April, we lost 200,000 jobs. We're down about half a million jobs since pre-pandemic. Most of those people who are impacted, we know it's been disproportionately impacted women, younger people, and especially those in the sectors around food and accommodation, culture and recreation, which I think globally, there's a lot of common threads there. And so when we think about how we're going to come out of this, it is about how to untie this, this knot of that we have formed, you know, in many ways, the shutdown was easier than, than the reopening because it has to be slow and gradual and phased. And we have to think about those who are really disproportionately impacted, particularly women and, and I'd say small and medium businesses. The cost, uh, we all are very grateful for any government support of which there has been quite a bit in Canada, but we're gonna have to pay that off. And I'm very worried about the cost being passed on to small and medium businesses at a time where they can't afford it. So we know that there's policies that have really helped around digitization for many small and medium enterprises, but that's taking a, a bit of a, uh, uh, it, they are going to have to invest in that. And there are there is some government support for that, but how do we start to pay off other 
um, investments that the government has made that we know will be pushed down to business. So uh, I am quite concerned about what the next 12 or 18 months hold, even though I am also very optimistic about the economy run, rebounding at a very quick pace. But I, I, I do look at that long term and think that we are at a unique point of transformation and, and I really do hope that business and government can work together to be able to leverage this. I, I think I, I say that there's an opportunity in every crisis. So, you know, there is opportunity here. And, and I think we have an opportunity to really leverage some strength in our economy. And I think uh, just uh, as a, a secondary on this, uh, Bridget, can you, I mean, I live in Vancouver, so I know uh, the importance and power of the Vancouver Board of Trade. Can you just for the audience, let people know you, how you, what, how the, um, the association is made up and, and, and some of the things that you do in support from a policy perspective in support of uh, the companies that are members of uh, Van the Vancouver Board of Trade. Thank you, Stuart. That would have been a good place to start. So thank you for the reminder. Uh, the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade was established 134 years ago. Uh, we represent about 5,500 members, and really it is a broad representation of our economy. And it is uh, really from uh, all sectors that you might imagine, but uh, it really is a majority of small and medium businesses. We represent about a third of the workforce in, in, in the region. And so uh, for us, you know, one of the, uh, and then I'll let my other, my colleagues talk as well, because I'm really interested in their point of view. But one of the things we have been really focused on is about our central business district and how to bring that back to life. How do we get people back into the downtown core and culture and food and accommodation and international students and bring that life back to our downtown cores, which are, is essential to every region to have that thriving. So that has been a big focus for us at the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade as well. And again, just one, one more thing to, because I'm, I'm often very curious in terms of the makeup of MSMEs in the Vancouver Board of Trade, you do have quite a number of small, uh, the, small enterprises. The majority of our members. So of our 5,500 members, the majority are uh, small and medium businesses. Absolutely. Great, yeah. So Hafimi, over to you now, um, just to, to remind you, how are you seeing things? And, you know, Brunei uh, is, a, is a small country, but you, again, have an, you know, I've had this conversation at ABAC meetings and <laughs> it's, a, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating um, business culture that you have there. So how does, how has the pandemic impacted the uh, MSME sector in, um, in Brunei and, and from your own experience across the region, because uh, you do an awful lot of work in ASEAN, I know as well. Correct. Um, again, again, once, once again, uh, thanks, thanks, Stuart, and also thank you to the Asia Pacific Foundation for, for the opportunity just to share thoughts and our ideas. And you know, I think there's a lot of similarities um, amongst our panelists as well in all of the situations that we're facing at the moment. Um, I, I am an MS, MSME myself, um, although you know, with a variety of different companies, uh, but having the same teething issues that every MSME is going through at this particular point in time. Um, in Brunei, our, 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 our population is small. I mean, we're, we're less than half a million people. So in certain areas, we're, we're less than even a city block in terms of population. Um, uh, but we have our own challenges, but we have also our own opportunities. I think what we've seen in a year of the pandemic is the ability for the, for the community as well as the business sector together with the government to come together um, very, very quickly um, and, and very much in not just a supportive manner, uh, but in a well thought out manner. Um, I say that in the sense that the MSME was actually the, the earliest um, sector that got help from the government um, through having uh, floating free platforms, e-commerce platforms, uh, people, you know, companies were being onboarded, not just companies, but individuals who mom and pop type, uh, type of um, enterprises uh, were encouraged to just get online. Um, they had even set in place systems uh, with logistics providers, et cetera, at very minimal costs, uh, just to get a distribution um, channel open. So I would say in, in, in less than what would have taken normally five to six years to digitalize and pe have people on board with e-commerce happen literally overnight. So I guess that's, that's essentially a, a very positive um, outlook. 
But on the secondary side is the fact that we are also like many other small economies dependent on um, tourism coming into Brunei um, and vice versa. Um, they, obviously the logistics industry has taken a huge hit even with our borders uh, where we're still very firmly shut at the moment. Um, and, and I think that's, that's the, the hurdle that we have to overcome. Domestically, we can only spend so much with, with a population of less than half a million people. Um, and, and I think that's still the challenge that we face today. On the flip side, uh, the fact that we can promote services regionally, I think that's something that um, not just from a Brunei perspective, but within ASEAN and ABAC um, is, is trying to facilitate more of the services trade. But I think in general, the outlook for, 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 for MSMEs um, is, is still 50-50. I think with the third waves that everybody's encountering and it's cutting through across the region, um, you know, I think Bridget was right, you know, you're not just losing jobs, but businesses are closing. Um, so how do we then encourage governments to say, look, can you go more down the path of upskilling? Can we ensure the support systems are there to reskill um, very quickly, the businesses can pivot or individuals who are entrepreneurs can pivot very quickly from their traditional uh, business model now and how do we move that. So, so perhaps just that as a, as a scene setting for, uh, for the moment, Stuart, and then I'll, I'll let my other colleagues as well uh, chime in. Thank you. If I can just maybe push on a couple things, uh, one, one thing in particular. So you're, you're close to Singapore and Indonesia. Uh, and I'd be curious, can you make any sort of comment on how, well, think they're quite different in many ways, but yeah. uh, certainly the MSME community in Ind Indonesia is, is enormous. Um, yes. So can you make any comments from your perspective on how they're dealing with this? Because I think it's an important economy in the context of ASEAN and understanding yep. how they're dealing with this is I think uh, is important yeah. for everyone to, to know. I think, I think uh, collectively governments uh, across, I guess within ASEAN and, and mentioning as well the economies that you, that you stated, uh, Stuart, is the fact that the government did go to the ground very quickly. Um, Indone if I can give an example in Indonesia, they actually teamed up with um, private sector companies that were already doing um, MSME financing um, on that very micro level, micro and small. And, and, um, and that, the only reason I know that is because I know somebody who's actually doing this. Um, and the government, the government in, in Indonesia actually used their community funds and routed it through this uh, private sector um, organization to get to the ground quickly. So that's a very uh, succinct example of how the public-private partnership could, could work very well. Uh, to the point that, you know, uh, the, the, he, he's, he's essentially his organization has now got uh, bought over a bank. And you're looking at something like this that's just happened over the past year. Um, but that's the way of, of that particular scenario where the government using its, um, its leverage on providing support to the MSME, but using it through a private sector driven uh, platform. So I think that's one example that has worked very, very well in, in, in Southeast Asia. Um, I think Malaysia has, has, that, has got a very similar um, structure. I'm not as fluent in the way how Singapore has done it. I think they've given them more on a, a, a both a monetary incentive approach, especially across the board uh, with whether it be individuals or companies, et cetera. Um, and at the same time, encourage more tax rebate um, structure in terms of getting the MSME to reposition, especially those that have not digitalized. I think the big push for digitalization um, in ASEAN uh, has been a, a driving force that has been able to support um, the MSME um, in, in its current crisis. Sustainability obviously is a separate separate matter. Um, so you know, obviously, when you when when we when we talk about ASEAN, um, the the topic and the theme of building back better um, is is very much fresh in the minds of of policymakers um, at this moment that. Even if once we actually recover or, or we get over this hurdle with COVID-19 um, is the fact that we, don't, we, we can't go back to normal. We can't back, go back to the status quo of how businesses are run and how government interacts with business. So I think that's something that's crucial and that will already definitely change. So I think in fresh in the mind of policymakers, that's essentially where, yes, we build back, but we build back better. 
No, I think that's a that's a great point, and uh, maybe we might come back to that one, Julia. You know, it's uh, you're in in Peru. Uh, it's a fascinating place, uh, and you know, congratulations on your recent uh, recognition as one of the fifty most influential people in Peru. I think that that's that's uh, to your credit and honor. Um, your thoughts on this? Uh, it, it must be quite a bit different in many ways in Latin America and Peru than uh, than you would see in, in North America and, and in Asia. So, your thoughts on on the impact of COVID and um, in how things are going to be looking post pandemic? Yeah, you know, it is different, but at the same time, we have a lot of similarities due to the pandemic and all the characteristics it has. I was listening to Hafimi and in Peru, as you know, one of the most important industries is services through tourism and gastronomy. And those are two of the MSMEs that have been more impacted in our economy because lack, lack of tourism, lack of visitors, the impossibility of the people to go out to eat to restaurants uh, as much as it was uh, allowed in the past because of the restrictions and different categories of the pandemic in the country make it difficult. So we, we are trying to engage into a new economic scenario where social distancing is the norm, where uh, industry will have to get to the ready in order to receive visitors little by little. Tourism has to be reactivated with a lot of restrictions and a new a scenario that we, is uncertain for us at this point of time. However, we believe that the limitations on quorum and operating hours of commercial facilities has been a challenge and an opportunity at the same time. Uh, people in Peru are resilient by characteristic and we are trying to get our economy reactivated with a lot of um, innovation in one hand, but creativity on the other one. Uh, the, the, the toughest uh, challenges is the fact that uh, people have to eat so they cannot stay home even if the government mandates so when they mandated it in the past in, in at the beginning of the pandemic. So we have to overcome the challenge of social distancing. Many people are in the streets uh, selling with their MSMEs products, but they have to keep the, the protocols so that the, the business is also flowing. We have to, uh, at this point of time, reactivate the economy, but we have to, and thanks to the government, there have been some challenges to be able to reactivate it and try to amplify also more traditional challenges. Okay, for example, uh, MSMEs are uh, receiving payments for their products not as timely as they are supposed to, which makes it, makes it difficult for them to keep going. Uh, there are difficulties also to access um, financial systems. Uh, there is limits to, to credit, especially when in an uncertain world. So government has prepared and has offered already last year um, a scheme of soft credits so that have been given to not only to SMEs, but also medium enterprises that needed to avoid bankruptcy so that they could keep going to refrain them from firing people and many of those small businesses have been able to survive thanks to these credits, okay? Uh, despite this, uh, there are a lot of um, businesses that have closed. And as uh, Hafimi was mentioning, and this is something common, they will need to reinvent because of all the restrictions that we have been facing. Another restriction was delivery of products because of the restrictions uh, of the partially by the sanitary protocols and the increase of shipping costs. So at this point of time, we have witnessed in Peru an expansion of business-led solutions for the last mile delivery and new competitive services for both national and international delivery. So there are, there are uh, changes and we have a lot of challenges. I agree with Hafimi, there won't be a uh, post-pandemic uh, world or country in Peru, just like before. As I mentioned, we have to reinvent and we will have to create solutions just to continue receiving visitors for tourism, for all the restaurants to be able to, to reopen because many of them uh, have had to close because having 30% of their customers eating at the restaurant, 
didn't pay for the cost or the very high cost of rent of, of um, their locations, okay, depending where they were located. Many of these restaurants have reinvented themselves, but uh, and are offering delivery services, but it's not good enough to, to keep afloat. So we, we believe we will have to work the way through, okay, get accustomed to the new normality and try to help all the MSMEs or as, more, as, um, as many as we can in order for them to not only survive with these credits the government supported and, and supplied, but also uh, for these services to be reinvented and more jobs to be created. Stuart, I don't know and if, if I, I can ask. <laughs> no, no, I think you, you covered a lot of interesting ground that we will probably come back to. But I was going to ask, how do you find that your neighbors, uh, how have they been coping with it? And are they, uh, are they uh, performing as well as you are? Or, or, are they, or is this a challenge as well? Because, again, we are in a situation in Canada where we can't even travel to the United States right now. And, there, you know, the border issues creates a huge problem for us in many, many ways because our, our economies are so integrated. Um, and so I'm just curious if this is the same situation that you have in, in Peru. We have a lot of um, interaction with Chile regarding mining, for example, the business I, I work for. And the closure of the, the borders in Chile, Chile did affect us because we import or export some supplies uh, and exchange some goods, the mining related, and thus have, uh, that, did, that did have an effect on us. So uh, people being a, be, not being able to travel has affected also supply of services, technicians that uh, give services to Chile or Chileans that give services to Peru have also been refrained from, from traveling. So that's, that's one of the main ones. Uh, unlike Chile, in Peru, we have the challenge of vaccination that has started slowly. And now the government is covering in most of the regions, uh, people elderly than 70 in Lima, 60 is starting soon. People older than 60 are going to start receiving vaccination. Chile is ahead of us because they have uh, progress rapidly and have secured more vaccination than Peru did because of all the political hurdle we faced last year, having three presidents almost in six months is, not, is a challenge for most of the people in the world. So it was also a challenge for us. So uh, that's, that's something that uh, we see. I know Ecuador was uh, facing very rough times, especially last year and is doing better now. And we hope that all of them can overcome the challenges just like uh, with the same resilience and hopefully faith that this has to be over and, and the world and Peru and Chile, Ecuador and others be accustomed and, and recreate their, their business and MSMEs as well. Um, it's a very interesting. I, I, I'm going to reframe the second question a little bit and uh, not to catch you off guard, but I just, I, it, it is, it's somewhat aligned, but it, 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 I don't want you to have to repeat yourselves in some cases. So, um, Bridget, I, I obviously talked to Canada's uh, ABAC member, um, Jan De Silva, and she has some top of mind issues that she's working with you and uh, also the, uh, this, your, the your, your sister organization in Montreal. So what are the, what are the sort of key policies that uh, you and Jan and your colleague in Montreal, what are you talking to the government about? What needs to be done? What are like the two or three most important things that need to be considered? And from a policy perspective, I'm going to ask the other two the same thing. You know, there may be some repetition, but maybe there's some coherence that we can get from this. Well, I think most immediately, and these are conversations I'm having with uh, my colleagues in Montreal and Toronto, is around a reopening plan. And, you know, that might seem that we are jumping the gun on this, but I think to go back to my comments about how it's more complica complicated, rather, to unravel what we did in the last year. So the ability um, to get supply chains back running, to uh, recruit talent, and in some cases recruit and retrain or recruit and train talent. So that reopening plan and really thinking about it in regards to not just our um, a tourism economy, but a visitor economy, economy. So that is business travel as well. It's events, it's uh, conferences, it's all of that. 
and to make sure that the governments uh, across the country have a similar approach and there's continuity and there's also communication and consultation with businesses. So for example, right now, Quebec has uh, announced its reopening plan and looking quite, um, uh, I would say broad for the summer and a lot of flexibility and bringing people together, um, at least that is the plan in Quebec. Whereas here we are in British Columbia and we're awaiting um, details around a reopening plan. So for those people who are thinking about coming to Canada uh, from other countries, you might, that, that might be you, Julia. So then you're wondering if there's a different <laughs> approach in Quebec than there is in British Columbia, how do I plan my trip? So I think there also there needs to be um, that, that connection and that continuity across the provinces so that health and safety is first and foremost and that there's an understanding from a global perspective about what the experience is going to be like coming to Canada. And that goes from everything to the reopening plan, to vaccination, uh, to how are we going to deal with a vaccine passport or are we? There's a lot of complex pieces that come together. So that's first and foremost um, one of the pieces that we are working together on. I would say the other piece that we are working on is more of a long-term approach. When I think about the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on women and around younger people, uh, thinking about how to get them back into the workforce, childcare comes to mind as one of those really important pieces. And the federal government made an announcement with the budget recently, a significant investment that would allow women to get back into the workforce who maybe had to take a step back to look after their families during the pandemic. That is going to be a big piece as well as reskilling um, or upskilling some of those people who have been impacted, who are working in tourism and culture. And, you know, those people that were furloughed maybe 15 months ago have gone on to do something else. So, how do you get them reskilled or upskilled? And I think that's going to be uh, an enormous undertaking. And finally, the one thing I, I would say too that we are working on is we are at a place globally of incredible crisis around our climate change, but also incredible opportunities. So how do each of us in our own jurisdictions and our economies leverage that opportunity and think about growing the green economy? And for my colleagues in Montreal and Toronto, some of that approach is, you know, what would be the specialties in each region and how do we then knit something together that is a good, is a narrative and, and would attract investment globally? So that, that's a couple of pieces, um, but I'm really interested to hear what my colleagues would say as well. Yeah, and there's a couple of themes that came out of that, and I'm, I'm sure uh, Hafimi and Hulia would, would, would agree. It's in the, in the context of, um, of the regions, we're all in this together, and this the yeah. importance of collaboration and cooperation. The challenges that we have in a, in a country like Canada is we're you know, 3,000 miles from coast to coast, uh, 10 provinces, it's a federation, everybody has their own way of doing things. And then of course, we're next to the United States with 50 states and, uh, you know, and the federal government that's, uh, that's, you know, uh, hasn't been all that kind to us recently, but it might perhaps will be better going forward. But the, um, the, the issue is how do we can, this is such a global issue, we all have to think about ways to work together. Anyway, uh, Hafimi, what are your thoughts from What's top of mind for you uh, when you're having your conversations uh, within APEC or ABAC or within yeah. ASEAN or, or even within Brunei? Okay, I guess, um, you know, uh, Stuart, I think I'm going to give a plug to, to what ABAC has done in supporting APEC, seeing that this is an APEC platform, um, as, especially our colleagues in ABAC Peru, uh, which is quite timely because they did what, 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 they hap what happened last year is they actually set up uh, an initiative um, looking at a dashboard of a couple of key um, government policies that were put out straight away to support um, MSMEs. Then they, they, they then obviously digitalized that, put that online. Uh, it, is, it is available and I'm sure Julia will be able to speak a little bit more on this. And it covered a variety of um, sectors and sections that were crucial to, to the MSME in, 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 in its thought, in its process and in its outcome. I think this, uh, what you've been able to, 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 to indicate, especially within APEC, is the fact that the private sector um, has not been hesitant in being forthcoming in sharing ideas. 
And I think Bridget would agree with that and you know, synonymous with what you do um, in the Board of Trade is the business will not be shy at this particular point um, because they know what's happening on the ground. Um, policy is one thing, uh, but at the same time, implementation of the policy is two, two different ends of the state. So I think the, the next step that, that ABAC and, and hopefully um, the support within ABAC is going to do is actually look and provide a feedback mechanism uh, to this dashboard that actually says, okay, this works, this doesn't work. Maybe this works better in this way. Um, but for, for governments to be open to that, they need to make sure uh, that the, the, the method of communication is not just uh, clear, transparent, but also willingness to react and adapt. I think that's one thing we find in government is the mechanisms work a little bit uh, differently. They have different challenges compared to business. Um, but as Stuart said, um, you know, we're all in this together, right? So I think we have to, we, we, we're at a point in time whereby um, the gov governments recognize the, not just the importance of the way business incorporates itself into policy, but the fact that policy actually is there to make sure that businesses can operate in a manner that's, that is uh, accountable to the community, uh, but is also giving them enough leeway, enough space, enough breathing space that they can run innovation, that they can run different ideas. Um, and that's what MSMEs uh, really hope for all the time, is the fact that you know, um, that you want that space, you, you understand the laws, you understand the rules, and you, and, you, and you want the guidance, but you need that space to just challenge and, and to push the envelope a little bit better. And, and I think that's something that um, for MSMEs, I guess if you're talking pre-COVID, um, the restrictions have always been there. Um, and, but I think the, the ability to adapt is where each economy will be able to, to move out of this pandemic quicker. I think if we're gonna stay, stick to a very hard, fast rule pre-COVID, um, it will be very challenging for us to be post-COVID. So I think the economies that open up quicker are the ones that are saying, look, you know what? There is no playbook for this, or the playbook from historical fact is not relevant to where we're at today because we have different tools. So I think that's where, um, when, when, you talk, when we talk about policy, Stuart, is that the policy, is, policy has to be crafted enough that we understand the end goal, uh, but we'll give you that breathing space because we are all in, you know, we're all facing unprecedented times at the moment. So, you know, that, that's my thoughts um, as, as to where we're, where we're dealing with it and how we feel that we can move forward. With it. So basically, flexibility and adaptability in the, in the policy environment, policy and regulatory environment. Um, Julia, your thoughts on this? What, what's top of mind from your perspective and what's, what's involved in, if nothing else, what's involved in the plan to go forward, right? Yeah, before we go forward, we need to step back for a second and we need to identify at least, I believe, we need to identify all the social and economic gaps that have been or worsen because of the pandemic. We had a challenging world already before pandemic and due to the COVID-19, not only poverty, unemployment and others have uh, increased. Okay, this is not positive at all, but uh, if we cannot identify those gaps, it will be very hard to get uh, policies to digitalize uh, MSMEs, at least in my country, or promote digital uptake in areas where basic needs have not been met. You cannot, I mean, I mean, although this is a priority now, not only to have internet and, and have MSMEs be part of the world through digitalization, okay, we also need to think that uh, sanitation, water, electricity have to be properly provided. And for that, we need to identify that. So bridging the social gaps is very important for providing MSMEs a real chance to grow, first of all. I do believe that, uh, as, just as Hafim said also, a very close coordination on private and public efforts is needed to achieve an appropriate ecosystem for the development of and the growth of MSMEs. For example, training and technology transfer from large enter enterprises to local MSMEs will not have a sustainable effect if governments have suffocating taxing schemes for entrepreneurs and government apparatus full of red tape. Okay, this is 
in Peru already you have a lot of MSMEs that are not formal. They are just informal, mm -hmm. and if the government is going to be applying more taxes and others, we are going to suffocate the, the, the few formal ones, okay? In the other way, an online bidding system for public procurement that provide business opportunities to MSMEs won't go the long way if corporations are not providing timely payments for their small suppliers. So we must secure both private and public actors and also make sure that we are pursuing the same north in benefit of MSMEs digitalization and progress as well. Otherwise, we won't be able to to advance. Uh, we also believe that uh, because of the world changing and because of the increase of the problems we had before, uh, identification of minorities that fail to integrate efficiently into the business sector, such as indigenous communities and other underrepresented groups is key. These are sectors with incredible potential for growth and in different sectors, not only gastronomy or producing of coffee, for example, here in Peru, selling uh, different um, small tokens for tourist, tourists and, and others. In this regard, we believe digitalization can be a silver bullet to achieve the indigenous community's insertion into the economic activity and also be able to provide them at the same time with training and education for their development. So there is an opportunity in the pandemic. Okay, because everybody is becoming digital now, and this will be a, a, an opportunity to try to reach as many people as possible and include as many people as possible as well. In many cases, indigenous communities live in remote areas that difficult uh, their access to proper education or other basic services. So if we can make a internet cover most of these places, they will have access to what they didn't have in the past. So that's the opportunity. Sometimes uh, MSMEs and or uh, small indigenous communities get to fill basic needs through the private provision of large companies operating around such, such as extractive industries, for example, that are the providers of services, water, internet, the schools and others, replacing the government most of the times. However, not letting anyone behind should be a national policy and governments should undertake all the efforts required to integrate everybody into the benefits of economic growth and using technology is an important solution and an opportunity for all, for all of us. Additionally, since uh, Hafimi already mentioned this, I, I'd like to just uh, uh, rephrase and say that COVID-19 MSME policy dashboard that was developed not only by, by Peru, but with the help of all ABAC, is a dashboard that uh, helps us uh, originally to, to put all the policies like a repository, it's a repository of policies implemented by APEC economists to alleviate the negative effects of, of the pandemic. Okay, so we, on the MSMEs. So we have the initial objectives to collect and organize those policies developed so that everybody could see and do not reinvent the wheel, okay? Say, looking at what Brunei did, we can copy what is, uh, or is still with pride in order to be able to apply things and policies that work in Peru, for example. But uh, now we believe that the, this dashboard can be even more helpful and we would like to take a next step so that we can include proposals on how MSMEs can continue to develop under a post-pandemic scenario with updated information on, on the real impact of the measures that we have implemented and have already included in, dash, in this dashboard. So hopefully this will be a tool that you can visit. It's in the comex.org.p uh, 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 web, okay? And we can share it afterwards or for everybody to have it. But uh, we believe this collective effort of sharing good practices will help everybody to be able to, to come out of these pandemic effects faster. And I mean, you've said some very interesting things and uh, I applaud you know, your comments about uh, what I would call digital equity, I make, making the ability for access to internet uh, open to all levels of people and classes and society. And I think that's a, that's a very critical issue and something that we've actually written on at the foundation. And if I could just make a plug for a couple of things that we're doing at the foundation, obviously this uh, APEC Canada uh, Growing Business Partnership is putting together um, 
the necessary information for MSMEs to, um, you know, at the time that it was, was we first set it up, it was all about, you know, bringing people uh, and improving their abilities to succeed in an entrepreneurship and, and in ventures, uh, in their ventures. And what we have now is really a toolkit that will provide people help coming out of the uh, out of the pandemic. So I encourage, you know, we've done toolkits for four different economies, but there's some common themes across them. The second thing that we did at the foundation, which I think is, uh, is we've now been able to, um, to build a proposal and we're in the process of doing research, uh, collecting all the work that we've done. Um, once, the, once COVID struck, we were aware that Asia in particular was well ahead of what we were doing uh, in Canada. And we did four months of work in this area. We've been able to pull together all that research that was done and, and, and we're doing a project for PHAC to basically say, what are the best practices? So what makes me um, interested in what you're saying about the dashboard is this is something else that we can incorporate into that, uh, into that um, project that we're doing for, for PHAC because I hate to say this, I don't think this is the first pandemic of this scale that we're gonna be seeing going into the future and the better prepared we are for the next one, that's in everybody's interest, quite frankly. Um, and I just wanna say that uh, I'm just looking at our time and we do have a couple of Q's and A's in, in, in the box. Oh no, it's not a Q and A, but uh, someone from your team, uh, Julia has put the, um, uh, the link <laughs> dashboard into the Q and A. Uh, so that, that'll be helpful. Um, but I would encourage people, if you do have questions, please uh, put them in the, in the Q&A box or the chat box and uh, we'll, uh, we'll get to them. Um, I, I want to now go into the basically the third area, which I think is important. And we talked about digital innovation a couple of times over the course of uh, the last 40 minutes. Um, what, from your perspective, and I think not everybody's going to have the same answer here. So this is why it's important to be able to compare notes. So Bridget, you know, what have you seen has been really, in the context of your membership, the digital innovation that's had the biggest impact for them? We uh, have been surveying our members throughout the pandemic. And the last time that we surveyed our members, we asked specific questions about digitization. And it was interesting that about 40% of our members said that they had done something around digitization to offer their services or their products online. I think what was more interesting was about 60% saying they were going to continue to invest in that. Uh, since that time, uh, government, both here in our province and also the federal government, have offered incentives to help small and medium businesses to put their products in and just to start an e-commerce uh, site or to, to somehow digitize. And I think that's been really, really important. Uh, you know, you look at uh, whether it's a restaurant that has put their menu online and they can be ordering for takeout or whether it's, uh, you know, I know some manufacturing um, companies that really started to have e-commerce where their products could be bought, bought online. I think one of the things that we haven't yet thought through because we haven't experienced it is what is this next 6, 12, 18 months going to look like around digitization? And I'm talking specifically about the return to work. So we're all used to having this digital world, but as people come back to the office, we're going to be in a period of inequity where there'll be some in-person experience and some in on online experience as well. And I think that's one thing that we're going to have to grapple with as well as are we going to be in a situation where there is that digital inequity? And even in Canada and in British Columbia, we have that digital inequity. So that has to be solved as well. I think incentives by governments to help accelerate small and medium businesses to digitize is really, really important. Um, but again, uh, you know, I think there- If I there can are... ask you, it's easy to say an incentive, Bridget. What do you mean by an incentive? What is well, it for from example, a policy perspective? Uh, What's that incentive? You know? uh, the BC government, uh, and I will give them kudos for this, is they offered a grant of up to $10,000 for small and medium businesses to get their products and services online. And I think that that was a big help for quite a few. But we have a lot of small, small, small micro businesses that they don't have the resources to apply for the funding or they don't have their products ready to go online. So I think this is going to be a, an interesting time where I would also say that digitization, that the big gap continues to be gathering people. There is no, uh, I don't think there's any way that we can replicate 
events and things like that, I think most of us are probably getting close to being zoomed out or, or whatever that online experience is. But so how do like in culture and recreation and live events, how do we digitize that? And I don't know that we can. So that is one big gap. And I don't know that that can be can be solved easily. I think that will be solved when we're the health orders are lifted globally and we can start to gather again. But you know, to ask that your question, what's really been helpful is um, incentives that really like help small and medium businesses to give them the funds to to move things online, uh, and and that will continue to be important because I, I don't we're never going back to what we had, um, but I do think that there is going to be a hybrid time, and so how do we do that? I'm not entirely sure. So, so I guess I'll go to you, Julia. Now, just. It, does your dashboard cover incentives to for people to digitize and have, have you looking at that as a possible and if if that's the case what are you doing in peru to you know to in, in your you know from your perspective what is the most important what's been the most important or most helpful uh digital tool that has been put in place you know the government uh, started giving classes to students through aprendo in casa or learning from home through tv basically Okay, because there was no way to, to give classes on other way. You, we don't have coverage of internet in the full country. So that's one of the tools that uh, is uh, being successful to give classes. Obviously, there is always criticism of how, how good is implemented or not, but it's a very good uh, example. There have been other create, creative solutions that have been also offered. For example, specific businesses have growth around virtuality, just uh, enhancing their platforms. For example, uh, there is one case that is called Platanitos. It's a case of retail. Okay, They used to be, or they are, they are a traditional food, uh, shoe store in Peru that because of pandemic, not being an essential activity, had to close its doors. So they use the platform they used to have and they enhance it to start Feel, uh, selling first necessity goods, otherwise they couldn't survive or the people couldn't survive. So through this platform, they have not only survived, but also they enhance and grew their, their business. I have one example I want to share, and this is not due to pandemic, but uh, through Freeport, the, the company that uh, I work for in Cerro Verde, they, uh, there was a program that was developed years ago that is called Dream Builder. Okay, it's a, it's a basically it's an internet platform that uh, teaches people how to do business, okay, and enhance business skills through business management in a soap opera type uh, program in which night chapters are, are given and was always intended to be virtual through internet. And that's the way we have been giving it for free to many people. It was developed by Thunderbird School of, uh, School, uh, of Business, okay. And because of the, of the pandemic, we had several challenges. For example, people who could not uh, go, because in Peru, not everybody has internet at home. We had to invite people in the past to go to internet cabins. Because of pandemic, they couldn't go to take classes to internet cabins. So what we had to do is put the program in CDs or USBs for them to continue their training. So it's just a way that we have overcome the pandemic and continue the training of these people that have their MSMEs or are creating MSMEs in order to survive the pandemic. So those are the type of things that I think we need to, examples that we need to copy and we have to repeat in order to, to be more successful. And I agree, we need incentives. We need to reinvent people and MSMEs to while uh, we can receive more visitors and start the wheel of, of progress again. That's great. And Femi, this, you know, digital innovation is your, you're Bailiwick. You must have some <laughs> some some thoughts on this. And uh, uh, again, I, I, what I like about this, we have two ABAC members, and your job as ABAC members is to provide <laughs> advice to government. So this is uh, this is really, uh, I think, there's lots of rich information coming out of this conversation. So Hathimi, some thoughts here. Yeah, I think I, I think Stuart, as as I mentioned um, earlier on, is I think I think you've never seen economies accelerate so quickly to digitalization uh, process, procedure, law, whatever, uh, over the past 10 years that you've seen in the past 12 months. I think that's that's first and foremost a very positive thing. 
you know, governments have been pushing, private sector has been pushing for, for digitalization, um, again, over the past decade. But it's just the, the, the fact that it's been, it's happened overnight, um, over, over 2020, has shown that, you know, the hurdles that we create are our own hurdles. They're, they're not hurdles that are impossible to overcome. I think that's, that's one positive. The second is to also understand, and going back to Julia's point, is that you have to understand and recognize your challenges before you can move forward um, in, in, in thinking ahead. Um, I think what uh, within ABAC and even within ASEAN is the fact that regional integration has been crucial to why APEC exists, right? And the most pedantic of things that can sort of put a spanner in the works um, if I take an example, just trading across borders, uh, specifically on documentation, right? Just one small thing like this can, can upset a whole grand idea. Uh, this, in a way, um, has given governments more impetus to actually say, look, you know what? Forget about the 10 documents I, that I need you to sign physically, blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm just going to standardize one document. If you want to jump on this to make your transaction quicker, you follow this format, it's, uh, it's got a, a global standard behind it, et cetera, et cetera. And essentially uh, from end to end before your product even arrives physically, um, you've already cleared whatever government process uh, is necessary. So we've been able to compress um, through working examples, through the fact that you couldn't even move stuff across borders easily prior to the pandemic to something that just can happen overnight. Now, this has still been a challenge within APEC, obviously, um, in terms of getting basic essentials. And this is crucial to APEC's work and in ABAC's work as well, that we need these crucial essentials to be able to move cross-border um, tariffs and all that need to be, to be squared away. It's out of the hands of the private sector. We can move the goods, but it's still something that government has a purview on. So the, the voice of business is very loud in saying that, look, by, by making sure that you have standardization and you can do this digitally, um, using black blockchain as, 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 a, as a safe platform, um, enabling AI to run and, and give you better predictive analytics to everything that you're doing so that you can plan for better, right? So I think things like this, um, I think you, if, you, if, you, if you wanted to reinvent your career at the moment, Stuart, if you didn't have anything on analytics, or coding as a basic, um, you know, you, you can forget about in the job market. So I think things like this, um, which is which is second nature, obviously for our, our tech industry um, colleagues, but is now becoming the mainstay in our education systems. So I think this is something that uh, has the pandemic has driven that uh, the impetus for that to really move quicker. So I think that that to me is a, is a very good positive and that in everything that we do spurs the human desire for creativity. Um, we cannot disallow the fact that humans need to connect at any physical level. I think I agree with Bridget, you know, you do have your, your, your Zoom, uh, Zoom zones and then your Zoom not zones and maybe zombie zones, I don't know, zombie zones at, at some stage. Um, but we, 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 we crave for this interaction. Um, I think Bruna has been very fortunate uh, in, 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 in curtailing the, the pandemic, um, but at the same time, we also need to interact uh, because that, 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 that's what makes us human, right? Um, and I think uh, with, with regards to digitalization, the fact that um, corporates have also come behind it, but, but the best pack, the, for me, the, 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 the beautiful story out of this is the fact that civil society has really stepped up into the fore. Um, you're talking about NGOs who would have just sprung out from the woodwork to actually say, look, I'm going to take a leap. I'm not going to wait for, for the government to, to put something into plan. I'm actually going to take the lead. I'll create the platform. I will, I will mobilize um, the generous benefactors to put this available to the, the MSME. So I think that's, it, it, at least in the Brunei context anyway, um, that's been something beautiful that we've seen. So I think everybody coming together and supporting, not just your, not just, I'm not saying that we don't support the bigger companies, but the fact that they've given extra effort to support these smalls and micros 
um, within the community. So that's something that, and I think you've seen that across other countries as well, is that the desire um, and, you know, and echoing Julia's point that we have to deal with the basic um, issues in society to actually move us forward. So hopefully, you know, hopefully with through digitalization as a tool, I don't think it's the be all and end all. Uh, it is just a tool in itself, uh, but that would essentially allow us to spur and, and hopefully drive some of the delivery that we need to do um, in a quicker manner. So um, we have five minutes to go and have, I really do have one question I wanna ask the three of you and we try and keep it fairly short because I, I have to say thank you and I have to do some other things as part <laughs> of this process. Um, but um, you, we're sitting with, I'm sitting with three very successful, very powerful women. Um, just some thoughts uh, from a policy perspective to, to bring more women into the economy post COVID that will be successful. Maybe one thought from each of you, and you can expand on the thought because I think it's important. Uh, one of the things that we're doing at the foundation after doing eight roundtables across the country, um, you know, the lack of engagement with Asia uh, was something that came out of it. And from that, we now are running women entrepreneurship missions uh, uh, to Asia. And that, um, that I think has been quite successful. We've done three so far, one to Tokyo, uh, one to Japan, one to Korea, and one to Taiwan. Um, what would you say, uh, Hafimi, uh, start with you. One thing that you would say that needs to be done to bring more women uh, entrepreneurs, more women uh, activities into the economy that will help post COVID. Uh, okay, just uh, for me specifically, the support mechanisms to enable women to do what they need to do. Um, clear example, childcare support, um, family support, um, you know, getting, uh, better uh, representation and getting the, the mechanisms of that support in place. I think women will need to do, they'll, they'll know what, to, they'll figure it out, but the support mechanisms around it because they do have other traditional roles uh, that are not essentially always gratified in, in, uh, in, in, in financial terms. Bridget? I'm gonna break the rules and I'm gonna say two. Uh, childcare for sure and experts say that uh, the childcare if we, if this program that the federal government has announced, uh, it goes ahead, our GDP could jump by over a percentage. It would allow for almost half a million women to join or rejoin the workforce. So that's one. But I think the other one that goes hand in hand is wage equity. We need wage equity. And so I'll leave it at there. So I'll, I'll leave time for Julia to respond to. You would be surprised to know that in Peru, most of the MSMEs are owned and run by women. Okay, so... <laughs> What, in addition to childcare, because that's obviously needed, okay, a prevention of home violence is one of the things that is needed to be worked policy-wise, and the other is more training and education, and platforms like Dream Builder help the people to be better trained to manage better their MSMEs, because survival is the, is the key incentive for these MSMEs here in Peru, at least, so I, I think those are basic, training and childcare. Well, I just like to, to do a little wrap up. Uh, I've got uh, a minute to do that before I say thank you. But uh, there's some really, there's a, really, you have been, the three have been fantastic. And I really appreciate the time that you've taken and the, and the insights that you provided. So that, my thanks to each of you. Um, but something that came out of it uh, over the, a few things that came out of it from, from my perspective. One, the need for a plan. Uh, and I think defining the elements of the plan are, are critical. Two, flexibility and adaptability from a regulatory environment. Government needs to be understand what the what's in, what's involved in that process. Three, incentives and how you define those incentives, whether it's you know through childcare or whatever. But somebody needs to sit down and develop a set of incentives that will that will work for each economy. Maybe they will be different in Canada than in Peru than in Brunei. Four is um, uh, because change is happening so quickly is being able to understand that the regulatory environment can't catch up and that there has to be some way of anticipating where things are gonna go uh, from that perspective. So I think that's, a, that's another thing that came out of it. Standardization, Afimi, um, your, you know, your point there I came out towards the end, 
But you know, this is a role that I think is, is going to be really important because we're moving into a bifurcated world to a certain degree. Uh, what's happening in the West is going to be different than what's happening in China. And that in China is going to drive a lot of the standardization in Asia. That's just a reality. So we need to be able to say there's got to become there's got to be a meeting of the mind somewhere around standardization. And I think that, you know, is a all leads into something that I think is really quite important. We're going to be living in a hybrid environment uh, going forward. It's going to be virtual. It's going to be in person. The question is, all these elements you can put under the term or the heading of hybrid. And then once we understand that, and that's what the future is going to be, then we then I think we can plan our way as one element through uh, to the future. So again, my thanks to you. It's now six o'clock, and I'm going to do the final wrap up. Uh, if I can find it in my notes here, um, just to say that, you know, again, it was really a super conversation. And um, if people can follow up with you uh, through uh, the platform uh, and, you know, you can uh, follow up with our panelists and really at the end, it's, it's you taking your time from your busy schedules to speak to all of us about this important topic, particularly as it's business that's talking here. So from uh, us here, thank you very much for joining all of you on the on the conference tonight. On behalf of the Foundation, uh, Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada, I hope you have a great evening, uh, afternoon, um, and morning, depending on where you are in the world. And uh, we look forward again to staying in touch with the with the work, great work that's being done at ABAC and APEC, and through the work of uh, all of you who are uh, trying to understand what's on the next step. What are the next steps in our in our uh, in our future post pandemic so thank you very much <laughs> <laughs>